So we're going to talk about Stanford's responsive Drupal 7 themes. Uh, Open Framework and Stanford Framework are the two base themes we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I just wanted to get a little sense from the audience first. Um, how many of you are theming, actual themers, developing themes? Okay. And how many of you are just looking for themes to use in your next Drupal project? And uh, how many of you are like vendors uh, working on campus with campus partners? A few of you? Okay. Cool. Great. So I'm Megan Miller. I'm the web designer at Stanford Web Services in IT Services, and I work with Brian. Yeah, I'm Brian Young. I also work in IT Services. I work with Megan on these themes. Okay. And Drupal at Stanford. There's a lot of different ways to have a website at Stanford that's Drupal. Uh, we've got AFS, a place to host things. We have Collaboration Tools Installer, um, and we have Stanford Sites. Um, I can go kind of in reverse order. Uh, Stanford Sites provides a very structured kind of hosting situation. You have a set amount of modules that you get pre-installed out of the box. You have some configuration done out of the box. And we take care of all the security patches, updates, everything for you. So Stanford Sites is a, a really great platform for departments and programs that uh, need to host their website and have it be kind of taken care of so they don't have to think of kind of doing module updates and that kind of thing. Collaboration Tools Installer lets you um, install your website and if you push the buttons all at the right time, it will update the modules for you. Um, that said, if you get out of sync with Collaboration Tools Installer, then you're managing your own site. Uh, AFS is kind of complete control, I guess, over your install and um, running it, but hosted here at Stanford. So there's some different ways to have Drupal at Stanford. And um, our themes need to work with all of these and more, because a lot of these schools and departments go to some other hosting uh, provider or service. So um, our themes have to take into consideration all of these different platforms. In IT services, we provide uh, a lot of centralized tools and resources that need to reach a lot of different audiences. Some of these are single person, alone in their department, managing all the web resources for their department. And other groups have like really large teams, as we heard in the panel yesterday, if you were here. Do you want to talk about some of these? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of centralized tools and resources here on campus. Um, so first off, there's technical training. And um, so essentially anyone that installs a Drupal site here, um, they can actually get some help uh, by uh, contacting the technical training, uh, tech training uh, the group, uh, part of IT services. We'll also provide a lot of self-help documentation. You can get to those uh, online. Um, right now, all, all that, it's uh, still in development, I think. So, but uh, as time goes by, we'll, uh, it will be more fleshed out. And actually, later, we'll show you uh, some of these sites like where you can get the sub home uh, web resources. And of course, the Stanford Sites Hosting Service uh, that Megan talked about. Essentially, for those who are not familiar with the Stanford web environment, Stanford Sites kind of like the WordPress.com offering in that it's kind of uh, you have a limited set of mod like. Uh, modules or plugins basically that you're limited to that stack but it gives you a very fast and secure service and then if you want to install your Drupal site in a, in our Stanford AFS space it's similar to the WordPress.org offering where you can download this package install it in your local disk space uh, and then you can install whatever themes and modules that you want mm -hmm. so yeah and so we also create um, Drupal specific features and we have those available to the community and we use those in our development. And then the themes are also available to users of Stanford sites and departments, et cetera. So I'm just giving you a kind of broader review of our context here at Stanford because it's kind of important for um, the theming that we do. So uh, just to make really clear, what is a Drupal theme? Uh, look and feel of your site, this is the skin. And it's the design separate from the content. It's the way we display the content um, and not the content itself. We have several themes and they are centrally maintained, they are accessible, standards compliant, and very importantly, mobile responsive, and we have Stanford branding. We really want to make it easy for departments here on campus to go responsive and have their mobile website be really functional. And we just don't want people to have to think about this. We want to kind of take care of it for them. So this is really where we're coming from. Um, we've got a lot of websites here. And a lot of them are really complex kind of landing page, brochure websites about departments and programs that have a lot going on. And how do we kind of shift and uh, take those complex desktop 
friendly websites and make them mobile friendly. So that's one of the things that we're focusing on. In this talk, we're going to go through kind of what is responsive web design, how we developed our themes, how our theme stack is structured, which theme might be right for you, and just getting started on creating a sub-theme. So hopefully this is useful to you. All right, so first, uh, just an overview, what is responsive web design? Back in the day, we were designing for kind of more limited use cases, but now we have so many devices. We can't plan for what kind of device, what size of device um, that your website is gonna be shown on. So we need to plan for uncertainty. And this device diversity uh, is, it forces us to um, not think in terms of tablet, phone, desktop. We have to think in terms of any size, any device. Some mobile trends, 35% um, of American adults own a smartphone and 25% of those users say they only use their phone for browsing the web. So this is a pretty amazing stat and this is actually an old statistic now, I think this is 2011. So uh, this is, I'm sure this is way more now. Um, where you know nowadays I check in my email on my phone, I open my browser in my phone, I'm saving something to look at it later, but it's pretty much all in my phone. I know I'm guilty of this. In an ideal world, we would have this custom tailored experience for every device, we would work really hard, you know, you'd be on your phone, you'd have one thing, and, and this is great, and if you have the resources, go for it, right? But we don't often have those kind of resources. So instead what we do is we go responsive. And this is same content reused for each screen size, same code base. So this is a design that responds to the size of the browser or the device. Now by design here, we're talking mostly about layout. I mean, there are some style shifts, so maybe you want buttons to display differently or links to display differently, but most often than not, it's the layout that we're talking about when we talk about responsive design. So there's that single code base, one website displaying it in different ways in different screen sizes. If you haven't read this book, I you know, recommend it highly. Uh, it's a quick read. Uh, basically, Ethan Marcotte says, uh, responsive web design is a philosophy and a practice. We have to embrace the inherent flexibility of the web so we can design for the future. So this is kind of where we are coming from, thinking about responsive web design. So how do we implement it? I'm going to let Brian give you the lowdown. Yeah, so more importantly, how do we implement it? Uh, <laughs> so essentially, here are some uh, key things to think about when you're doing responsive web design. So first off is the flexible grid. So back in the day, you always think in pixels. So nowadays, you kind of want to think uh, as you're like in percentages instead. So instead of having like a 200 pixel left sidebar and like a 600 pixel center content, uh, that sort of thing. So that makes it very restrictive. But then if you think in percentages, more importantly in proportions, uh, that will really help you in the long run when you go into responsive web design because with percentages, as you squeeze things, it uh, corresponds to your browser window and you can actually just simply adjust the percentages and things will just stretch and um, squeeze as you go. Uh, so that's for the container portion. Um, also, the content within the containers uh, is kind of like media. Uh, with images and slideshows and videos, things like that. Also think in also uh, percentages. Uh, so as you, sh as you look at the video on your phone, you won't have to scroll to see the entire video. You want the video to just kind of like, fit on your screen. And Media Query is what we use to kind of load the different style sheets at the different breakpoints. Um, so in here, here's an example. So anything uh, with a max with a 480 pixels, do this, and then anything with a max with 1200 pixels, do this. And you can hide things, move things, change order of things based on uh, using the different style sheets. Now the media queries themselves are still uses the pixels, but um, and you can actually set these to whatever breakpoints you want. So um, later on we'll go into what technology we use, but if you want a very custom experience for a lot of different devices, you can actually fine tune these and have more style sheets for the different devices. But it's good to have a baseline of these style sheets, say like you have a mobile one and a desktop one to start out, later on you'll kind of have a tablet one. Um, but eventually this can get also 
um, kind of overwhelming too. So it's best to have just kind of settle on a few of these things, and most importantly, have your design be pretty flexible so that basically, if you load like um, at a certain size, your content will just fit. So that's just something to think about. So what should we be thinking about when we're designing responsive websites? Responsive layouts are about preserving content hierarchy and legibility. These are two kind of guiding core principles in our theme development that um, have, ha have changed the way we think about uh, responsive design. And um, let's talk about each of these. So first, content hierarchy. What is most important on the page? You can give it emphasis through size and order. In responsive web design, um, if we are creating a template that's going to be reusable to many de departments across campus, we don't have the way to customize um, the order of blocks for each website. Instead, we want our template to take care of the order, and we want to educate our clients that use that template to understand how that order will behave on the page. So here's an example. Um, I've just ordered them in numbers, and what happens is those numbers that you see on desktop translate to the order you see on a small screen. So uh, part of when we communicate with people about your responsive website is you need to understand how things get from this to this. So that's content hierarchy. And the other thing is legibility. Oftentimes, especially in Drupal, where we've got these great and powerful views, um, <laughs> we create things like this, and we call these micro layouts. Micro layouts are very small, um, complex layouts that exist inside of a block, and they're usually a structure that you want to have hold up when you get down to mobile, or maybe they change just slightly. But um, it's, it's a specific structure that associates content next to itself, like an image with text or something like that. And we want to be able to preserve these micro layouts. So we don't want things to get too squished. So here's an example of something getting squished in um, a responsive design, where the text really isn't that legible anymore. I mean, you could still read it. But you know, lines are being broken. It's just not quite as good. A good solution might be to kind of have things shift around as you get down into smaller sizes. Um, an even better solution, possibly, is can we build a responsive theme and a responsive pattern that never requires a drastic size adjustment of our blocks. So this has been um, a fundamental thing for us as we've been trying to build our themes and the way that they behave responsibly, uh, responsibly and responsibly. Um, they take someone's content in a block that might have a complex micro layout that we don't even know is there. We want to make sure that that little block gets preserved as it goes down um, into smaller screen sizes. Is this the holy grail? I don't know. We're working on it. So we think of this as kind of a content-first approach to web design, preserving content hierarchy and legibility as top priority in our designs. So this kind of gets us to how we developed our themes here at Stanford. We first went out and we looked at a whole lot of websites. Uh, we, there's so many websites here at Stanford. Um, and we looked for patterns. So we found some very common patterns in a lot of department websites and a lot of um, websites that we have to build for and manage with our clients. And what we did is we started generalizing this. So I, we kind of did a reverse wireframe exercise here, where we started finding pattern, pattern blocks and saying, oh, that's something that we see everywhere. We need to be able to support that. And what we did is we developed a layout library of all these common components that we've seen across campus. And we have a pretty large uh, layout uh, library. And this includes um, many different home page layouts that we see as common, common patterns, uh, landing, play, landing page layouts, and also sub page layouts. What are some of the patterns we're seeing over and over that, that departments are using, that labs are using, programs are using, and that we need to support? So from here, from these layouts and this layout library, we, just, we worked on articulating the responsive behavior we wanted to see. It's hard to change people's mindset to be mobile first, especially in an institution like Stanford where you've got a lot of academics involved, you've got a lot of different people coming from different backgrounds. Um, getting everyone to think mobile first isn't their priority. They don't, they don't think about the web first. They're thinking about their research. They're thinking about their event you know, that they're running. So can we do that for them? Can we take these complex layouts that we're seeing and just create templates that take care of all that for you? So we developed um, a set of responsive flow diagrams based on these layout libraries that we developed. 
that show how we can kind of try to not squish blocks too much. This is our real, this is our big goal. So at every stage, you know, block three doesn't ever get too different in size. These are two scale comparisons um, in, that you see on each breakpoint. So that was uh, kind of how we worked on developing these flow diagrams. Here's another one and another one. <laughs> So this is complicated. Um, how do we develop a way to support all this sophisticated behavior in a theme and also make it really easy for someone to build their website using our theme and have it do this? Um, our solution. Uh, so our solution is Open Framework, uh, this theme that we've been developing this past year. It uses uh, new responsive block regions to add sophisticated responsive behaviors in an easy to use fashion. Blocks and regions are native to Drupal. If you use Drupal and you've done any sort of site building with Drupal, you are familiar with blocks and regions. So we decided to stick with that as our kind of first model. So I mentioned these sophisticated responsive behaviors. What we ended up seeing uh, as we kind of developed these flow diagrams was two kind of conflicting responsive patterns, what we call row preference and column preference. A row preference pattern is where we're kind of preferring the row. Things line up horizontally, and blocks can bump each other down as the page squishes. So I might say at the large screen size, I want three columns. And as I go down, it needs to bump and turn down to two columns, and then bump to one column. Um, so this is, uh, we're just calling these flow regions. Sorry, I've got two names for everything. Too academic. Um, <laughs> Column preference is where you want like a newspaper editorial style. So maybe you don't want things to line up at the top of the row. You just want things to kind of go in order on the page. And uh, some cases where we saw this happen a lot were where you wanted one big block on the left, left, and then two blocks or some little configuration of blocks on the other side. And you want those blocks to behave like this. But then within those blocks, you want them to behave a different way. So th there's a lot of complexity going on. And between this kind of flow region and this stacked kind of column preference region, we can achieve both of these. By using a combination of these region types, we can get really complex with our layouts. So here's a wireframe of our new responsive regions in Open Framework. These are a set of flow and stacked behaviors, and they alternate. So you always get you know, Two columns, uh, two column flow, two column stack, three column flow, three column stack, four column flow, four column stack. Within those, you can divide infinitely if you want. But we've given you, we've tried to map to the most common layout scenarios we found when we did our research and create kind of empty regions for you to place blocks in that can create those complex layouts. Um, the other things we've added are some Drupal specific styles support. So uh, we, often you'll see views add something called a more link class to stuff. Lots of modules add these classes and um, we've been adding them when we build features and that kind of thing. So we've just built them in, um, given some uh, base styles to support them. We've added a few more that we think are helpful, um, like descriptor class and um, some border classes for images. The other thing we've added is this support for these common micro layouts. Um, we call them postcard layouts because they kind of look like when you have a postcard and you have the address on one side and your note on the other. Um, this is where we've got image and text. And what we've done is we've tried to make it as simple as possible to implement this in a views rewrite. Um, we, this is how we mostly use this. And I'm going to demo this in the next session. So if you stick around, I'll show you how this works. Uh, basically, you just need to create a certain pattern in your markup. And you can get these different postcard layouts really relatively easy. So trying to add some things in there that make life a little easier. The other thing that we've been working on is a sortable Drupal-friendly Drupal style guide um, where you can, uh, we'll, we'll be adding more styles to this as we go, but um, you can kind of search our style guide and say, show me all the image styles that are available in Open Framework. So, okay, so let's take a look and I'm going to have uh, Brian kind of give us a little tour of uh, Open Framework here. And let me just hide my toolbar. We can do that. Yeah, let's try. Oh yeah, this. make it like this. That one, yeah. yeah. Now we can do this too. Oh, maybe not. All right. So actually, we're going to uh, openframework.stanford.edu. This is where you will find a lot of the documentation on this particular theme. So I just want to kind of show you the regions that are available on this theme. Um, when we go to the say the overview, overview 
Um, so these are all the regions we have. I mean, it's a lot of different regions, but uh, and you don't have to use all of them. You can just use the ones that you need. But we built in some flexibility into this theme that you know, if you if you just need to have um, content laid out in a two-column fashion, you can just place your content, whether it's a views block or anything in a block menu block, and place it into that um, region. And automatically, as you resize things. Um, things will just kind of like uh, shrink and uh, adjust themselves. So um, as you see over here in this view, um, the right sidebar kind of dropped down to the bottom over here as uh, three blocks. So and of course when you shrink down even more it converts into kind of a two column layout and as I shrink even more um, everything becomes a single column. Yeah so so that's kind of, uh, so we want to take some of the think you know, a lot of people just want to put their site together quickly without really thinking, you know. <laughs> so, so in a way, if you don't want to do the thinking, there's already something built in there that works. If you do want to do more thinking, uh, then you can put it, you can develop um, your own custom layout. So in, in this case, we're using this content top uh, region. And uh, we're, we, um, we la later on we'll explain this. So there are some classes in there that you can put in that basically create this particular layout. So you just, in, on your block, you can assign span 6, uh, span 6 here, and then 12. So we work in a kind of a 12 column grid um, for each uh, region. So that in itself is pretty powerful because um, then you can always dice things up into 12 columns. Um, and you can get pretty sophisticated. And uh, along with media queries, what you can do is at the different uh, breakpoints, you can then have those blocks behave differently. So if you do want, say, the span six block to be larger in the mobile view, you can code that in yourself. But if you don't do any of that, it will still work relatively nicely. So. <laughs> Uh, that's the that's how we're thinking here, um, and also want to show you a little tool that we have on the site that shows you the block numbers. Let me see where is it. I think it's that. All right. So in a way, a lot of times, like people would look at a web page. So here we kind of put in some demo blocks. They all they're all actually images, but. Um, we, we have this little tool here um, that kind of shows you how things are ordered. Uh, definitely when you sh start shrinking the page, that's how things would be ordered in mobile. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, so this is kind of, um, you know, for those of us that build uh, websites, it seems pretty like, yeah, we, yeah this is no no brainer, right? But the same design can be done with the different block numbers. So sometimes, like say in this case, you notice how the about us, if you put it in the right sidebar, it's actually in the flow of content. It's actually number the 12th thing on this list of content flow. So as someone look at this um, on, mobile. on mobile, you don't want the about us like section to be all the way down in the bottom of your page. You kind of want that to be near the top, so so this is kind of um, so basically this is the part where you want to educate the and then your client or whatnot um, that there there is a difference in the two layouts, and this kind of goes into a little bit about mobile first also or more specifically content first. So you want your most important content in the top part of your page and not visually but in the content flow in your HTML. So that's the important part. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so maybe that's maybe enough demo for now. Sure. All right. Yeah. Yeah, and so um, the reason we we show this is because um, we we've tried to make a set of block regions that are very flexible and let you do a lot, but it also opens up to you got to know how those block regions behave. So in this case um, by placing the about us block into the right sidebar, uh, we have kind of done the damage to our hierarchy of content. And when we place it into, like if we go back to this region overview, um, this right sidebar drops down, right? So if you place, if you instead use this kind of like 
you know, content top or whatever region to do that top part of your layout or main top or whichever region you want to use, um, you can achieve a different hierarchy of content on the page. So there's some trickiness there. And in the next session, I'm going to go through site building tactics using our themes. So we'll show you all the tricks and stuff that we usually do when we build, build with our themes. Um, let's get back to the presentation and see where we left off. Ah, yes. OK. So we're going to talk about, we just demoed Open Framework. This is our base theme. And we've, we've built it in-house, but it is open source. And we've had a lot of really helpful con contributions from some people that are here at the conference, um, Kirill from Pro People, and then um, a bunch of other people have been committing. So this is an open source theme. It is uh, at the bottom of our theme stack. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why we have a stack of themes here at Stanford. And this is maybe kind of important, especially if you're working with a vendor partner and if you're trying to solve some kind of Stanford branding and identity problems, this, um, this theme stack is uh, important to understand. So at the bottom is Twitter Bootstrap. This is uh, a framework that provides base styles, CSS styles, and kind of JavaScript components. So it is not a Drupal theme. And um, on top of that, we have built a Drupal theme called Open Framework. On top of that, we have Stanford Framework, and then on top of that, we have sub-themes. So we're going to talk about each of these. Our goal with this theme stack is to have more code at the bottom so that you can make sub-themes really quickly at any level that you want to touch into the theme stack. And kind of like, let's say you wanted to sub-theme Open Framework. You have less code you need to do than trying to build Open Framework from scratch. If you wanted to sub-theme Stanford Framework, you even have less code to build. Um, so we're trying to make it easy to kind of connect in at the spot you want to connect in and have as little code you have to write as possible. Sub-themes at the top. And each th theme builds on the theme below it. So this allows for interchangeability and easy sub-theming. And this is really important for us as we build out Stanford sites and these central services where we want someone to be able to build their website in Stanford Wilbur and be like, oh, I don't like Stanford Wilbur anymore. I want the new theme, Stanford Jordan. And then they can just switch and everything still works. And this is, um, this is really important for us. So our whole kind of theme, the whole guiding principle here is we want interchangeability between these themes at the top. So like I said, Twitter Bootstrap gives base styles and responsive behaviors. It is not a Drupal theme. Open Framework adds us some additional base styles, uh, the Drupal block regions we just talked about, and some theme preprocessors. Stanford Framework adds the Stanford brand bars and the default Stanford colors and styles that as um, promoted through the Stanford Identity Toolkit. If you haven't been there yet, identity.stanford.edu is the place to go, and we can bring that up in just a minute. Um, if you are building a website where you need the Stanford brand, tr please try to sub-theme Stanford Framework. We really appreciate that because we've had a lot of instances where people are recreating the Stanford brand and doing it slightly wrong, and then we have to work with you to fix it. So, um, so this, we're trying to give you all the tools you need. We have some really nice theme options that let you configure in your theme options page, um, configure your site title the way using all the different kind of configurations that the Identity Toolkit uh, recommends. At the top, we have uh, kind of more fully fledged out um, sub-themes that have styles, so like kind of stylized. Um, Stanford Modern is being phased out, but it's um, it has like a bigger fat red bar at the top. Stanford Jordan is more like serif on academic scholarly feeling. And Stanford Wilbur is more kind of hip and whatever, we think at least. <laughs> <laughs> so which theme is right for you? Schools, departments, and other official groups requiring Stanford branding um, can request use of any Stanford branded theme, such as modern Wilbur Jordan. And you can request use of Stanford framework as a base theme. Um, so if, if you're a department working with a vendor, absolutely, that vendor can use Stanford Framework as the base theme. Um, this doesn't, it just has to go through a request process to make sure that the department uh, is approved. And if you are kind of an individual or like a student group or someone not wanting the Stanford branding, you can use Stanford Basic or Open Framework. Um, Open Framework uh, would be the good base theme to use. And Aha, this date, I should have updated this. On Tuesday, next, this next Tuesday, April 9th, we are releasing all these themes at drupalthemes.stanford.edu. And I'm just going to skip through this. Drupal 6, you can request if you care. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this. Um, 
site building with Open Framework and its sub-themes, that's going to be the session after this one. So I'm just going to give you a little preview in case you want to skip out and catch another session. Um, modules that play nice, since we're talking about blocks and regions here, uh, any, mo any module that makes blocks cooler is a module we like. So block class, it lets you put um, classes on your blocks, which is really handy. Uh, views, obviously, views makes blocks, great. Uh, Bean is really cool. Uh, what does Bean stand for? Block entity are uh, uh, something. entity something, something uh, right. as nodes or something. Block yeah. entities as nodes. Block entities are nodes or, or whatever. Nodes, yeah. Anyway, are not. <laughs> are not. <laughs> yeah. Not anyway, there. blocks are fieldable with Bean. This is really cool. So what you can do is you can make custom block types, just like you can make custom content types, and it lets you have um, really specialized blocks that go into your block system. So we use Context a lot, which is a module that lets you place blocks all across your site in different ways based on different rules. So you know, path, date, what, you know, all sorts of rules. Um, and with custom block types and context, you can go really far. And then um, I mentioned CSS Injector because on Stanford sites, you cannot make your own sub-theme. So instead, we point people to CSS Injector, which lets you add custom styles to your Stanford site's website. Um, it's also just a quick way to add CSS specifically to certain pages of your site without having to go through your theme. So um, this is a site, an example of a site that's an open framework-based site, um, and it's been styled with CSS Injector. So if you want to make a sub-theme of open framework, Stanford framework, or even one of our sub-themes, um, we have several layers of sub-themes going on, um, we try to make that easy as well. This is when CSS Injector isn't enough. Um, create your own sub-theme. So first choose which base theme you want to start with. Stanford Framework would give you those brand bars and kind of the site title configuration options. Uh, Open Framework gives you a much more basic uh, place to start. In Open Framework, you'll find a sub-theme kit folder that we've created for you. You can just copy that out, paste it, and rename a couple lines, and you're good to go. So this is what that kit looks like um, inside of Open Framework. So you can grab this folder, copy it, move it out, and rename, and there's instructions in there for where you need to rename stuff. Once you have your sub-theme set up, um, all you need to do is edit the CSS uh, and add any custom template files or whatever you want to do, change the block regions, but don't edit the code in your base theme. This is really critical um, for the sustainability of our community. Uh, we really we don't want you editing Open Framework um, unless you want to contribute to Open Framework, and we love that. So please, you know, check us out on GitHub if you want to connect in. Um, but yeah, it's good practice not to edit the code of your base theme, and instead use your sub theme to kind of override. And this is the fundamental thing that we do in Drupal: we override. So we're going to override all the styles in the base theme. All right. So um, this is our info. So uh, you can check out Open Framework at openframework.stanford.edu. We also um, put out a lot of information on the Stanford Web Services blog. So if you're wanting to like kind of see what we're up to and what's on our minds, that's a good place to go. Um, and if you want to get more involved with Open Framework or just want to hear about updates, join the mailing list, and we try to send out updates to that sparingly, but you know when it's when it's uh, needed. And um, before we kind of move on, I'm going to show you the Drupal Themes website so you guys know where to go for all the information about Drupal Themes. So drupalthemes.stanford.edu. Here you can get an overview of each of these themes. Stanford Framework, Stanford Wilbur, Stanford Jordan, Stanford Modern, Stanford Basic. Super fun. Um, but more importantly, you can demo each of them. So if you kind of load up each of these theme pages, you'll see the same content this is that inter interchangeability thing presented with each theme. So here's Stanford Framework. It gives you base styles that um, match the Stanford brand. And um, I'll show you Jordan so you see a little bit different. So this is a, the more scholarly one with the serif font. They're very similar. And in, going forward, we're going to be creating a lot more of these. We're kind of getting, getting our foundation built. And now we're going to have some more fun. So. Um, the other site I wanted to show you was identity.stanford. So this is the site that talks about the Stanford identity, how you can use it. Um, I think this is probably going to point you to us. <laughs> uh, there is, where was that one that was really important though? Stan department signature. So if you're involved in any sort of Stanford department or school project, you might want to review this. 
Um, these are the different configuration options that we have built into Stanford Framework. So you can literally check a box and say like move, um, use like, you know, what did we call this? Big heavy top line or school, school specific top line. You check a theme option and it'll enable that for you. So all of these configuration options here are supported and already pre-built for you. So if you're doing, you know, department program stuff, um, this is Stanford Framework's the way to go because we've built this for you. I think that's about it. So let me, that was kind of quick, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, does anyone have any questions? We're happy to go in a little more detail into our process, um, the code of the theme, how to get involved, anything else?